Good morning, everyone, and welcome to How Sri Lanka's Blue Whale Spurred a New Marine Conservation Model, a, concert, a conversation with Asha DeVos, presented by the New England Aquarium and the Lowell Institute in partnership with the Boston Globe. I'm Elizabeth Stevenson, Director of the Marine Conservation Action Fund, or MCAF, at the New England Aquarium. MCAF is housed in the New England Aquarium's research arm, the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. The other parts of our organization include our public facing educational center located on Boston Central Wharf, which is where you'll find our more than 15,000 resident animals and a sea turtle rescue program located in Quincy, Massachusetts. Tonight's event is made possible with generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allows the aquarium to offer lectures free of charge. We are also grateful to the Boston Globe for their collaboration in presenting this event. It's my honor to introduce today's speaker, who is an internationally recognized marine biologist, conservationist, and pioneer of long-term blue whale research within the Northern Indian Ocean, Dr. Asha DeVos. Asha is also a dear friend of the New England Aquarium. She's been affiliated with the aquarium since 2015, when she was named as our very first Marine Conservation Action Fund Fellow. Our Marine Conservation Action Fund is a microgranting and fellowship program that addresses critical needs in the marine conservation field, providing funding and other forms of sustained support to emerging ocean leaders in low and middle income countries. Over the years, MCAF has been honored to help support Asha's groundbreaking research on large whales in Sri Lanka and her work with local fishing communities. We've been very fortunate to learn a great deal from Asha and not only from her science. Her focus on the importance of investing in local leaders has been hugely influ influential on the MCAF program and many other programs and organizations across the globe. We are deeply grateful to Asha for leading the way on this important issue. Asha holds degrees from the University of St. Andrews, University of Oxford and the University of Western Australia where she is an adjunct research fellow Asha's journey as a marine biologist began in earnest in 2003. She had just finished her undergraduate degree and was working as a deckhand on a research vessel that was studying sperm whales off the water in the waters off Sri Lanka. While on duty as the ocean lookout, she spotted an enormous spray of water in the far distance. She realized that that spray had to come from something large and powerful, and that is where her story begins. Asha's career has focused on this unique population of Sri Lankan blue whales ever since. In fact, Asha's Sri Lankan blue whale project, which commenced in 2008, is the first long-term study on blue whales in this region. The research gleaned from this project has led to many key research publications and is used to inform policy at the local and global level. In 2017, Asha established Ocean Swell, Sri Lanka's first Marine Conservation Research and Education Nonprofit. At Ocean Swell, Asha and her team conduct vital marine conservation research alongside local communities while engaging in outreach and education. Asha's work has been showcased internationally by the BBC, the New York Times, CNN, TED, National Geographic, and Nature, to name a few. She proudly re represents her small island nation as a scientist with a towering record of achievement. She is the first and only Sri Lankan to have a PhD in marine mammal research, the first Pew Fellow in marine conservation from Sri Lanka, and the first National Geographic Emerging Explorer from Sri Lanka. She is also a TED Senior Fellow, a Duke Global Fellow in marine conservation, an MCAF Fellow, and a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. In 2018, she was named one of the world's 100 most influential and inspirational women by the BBC, and in 2020, she was named Scuba Diving Magazine's Sea Hero of the Year. Asha joins us from Sri Lanka today to discuss her life's work, which is to change the current marine conservation model in order to protect Sri Lanka's blue whales and to inspire the next generation of ocean heroes from all corners of the globe. Please join me in welcoming Asha for our talk. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Very, very generous introduction. Um, um, I'm super thrilled to be here today with all of you. I really appreciate your time. I know it's morning for some, afternoon for some, evening out here. So it's great to see a lot of people in the room, see, of course, 
not quite. But um, to start off, I want to say thank you to the New England Aquarium and the Lowell Institute for allowing this to happen, the Boston Globe for publicizing it far and wide. So we have a great big audience. There's nothing more uh, you know, fulfilling than having a lot of people in the room eager to learn. And uh, you know, like then I hope you all go out and share the story. So that's kind of my evil master plan at the end of it. Last year when I was giving the talk, I gave a New England Aquarium talk and I thought to myself, well, I was doing it on Zoom. It was in the pandemic and I was thinking to myself, well, hopefully next time I do the talk, I'll be standing back on that beautiful stage, uh, meeting all of you and talking, but it's not to be. So I'm hopeful for the next talk next year. All right. So thank you again. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about my work with Blue Whales, give you a little bit of a background story, but also talk to you a little bit about what it's taught me about how we can do conservation better. But to start off, I'm going to start from the very beginning. If I could tell my six-year-old self something, it would be, you did it. See, my dream of becoming uh, an adventurous scientist, which was my earliest career choice, uh, started when I you know, came partly because I used to flip through these National Geographic magazines that my parents would bring home. And I wanted to go where no one else would ever go and see what no one else would ever see. If I could tell my six-year-old self one more thing, I'd say congratulations. Congratulations on making it, despite the fact that all those faces that I was looking at in those magazines that were unfolding, you know, the adventures that were unfolding in front of my very eyes, the people in those magazines didn't actually look like me. They were people who didn't look like me, didn't resemble me working in places that very much looked like my home. I do believe there's a lot of truth in saying, you know, we say, uh, if you see it, you can be it. And I definitely believe strongly in that. But I want you to know that it's possible even if you can't see it. And I want you to know that there are exceptions to that rule. My love for conservation and serving my country started at a very young age. I think it was very subconscious. I watched my father strike this really fine balance as he dedicated himself to building the new as an architect, but also protecting the old. He would painstakingly paint, spend years restoring UNESCO World Heritage Sites in my country. His dedication to protecting these monuments over decades, I tell you, really decades, for the sake of his people, country, and the world was really powerful. And the ability, you know, to think about the ability to commit to doing something in service of others without seeking a personal gain and the unwavering long-term commitment that had to be made to be able to do this, uh, to restore and protect our common cultural heritage. You know, these sites are world heritage sites. They are really important to all of our collective human story. Uh, I think that probably subconsciously influenced my path to do much of the same for our natural heritage. As a result, my mother, brother, and I had the pre distinct privilege, I would say, of spending our days in and amongst these beautiful spaces and places, wandering them freely and really recognizing and understanding the importance of them to our human story. While beach holidays weren't a thing when I was growing up, my mother's insistence that we learned how to swim as a survival tactic obviously introduced me to this world, this watery world, and then it, there was no turning back for me. I'd found my element. Uh, it was basically a slippery slope uh, from then onwards. Over time, the four walls of the swimming pool started to feel very constraining as I used to eye the ocean every day as I went to school. You see, the thing is, although Sri Lanka is a beautiful tropical island with jurisdiction over eight times more ocean area than land area, um, the ocean has traditionally been seen as a place of extraction versus a place of recreation or conservation, uh, or, or uh, yes, uh, recreation or conservation. So it's not, our focus hasn't traditionally been protection or conservation. It is that economic space in countries like mine, and it's not the only one. Uh, the ocean is where fishermen go to fish. It's an important part of our economy. It has been, and it still is. So spending time in the ocean in any other way seemed very frivolous for people. And life ended at the shoreline, as you can see in this picture. Beautiful ocean, beautiful sunset, people on the coastline, but not a lot venturing or no one really venturing into the water. Even today, a vast majority of Sri Lankans can't swim. 
as a preteen, I would go for my swim sessions and then I would get out of the pool and sit on the side of the pool and talk to um, get into conversation with Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Now, some of you may know who this is, but if you don't, he's British science. Uh, he's a British science fiction writer. He wrote 2001 Space Odyssey. He's a futurist, inventor, and undersea explorer. He moved to Sri Lanka from the UK um, to dive our shipwrecks and enjoy the tropical lifestyle, and obviously to escape the British weather. I mean, let's be honest. Um, but I had the privilege of sitting with him and listening to some of his stories of his adventures in the deep. And one particular story has been deeply ingrained in my mind. And it, it went something like this. So he says, I was on this dive and I saw this big skin swimming past me. And I said, what was it? And he says, it kept going and going and going. And I was like, okay, and? And he says, it was brown. And I was like, oh my goodness, what is it? And he says, I don't know. I had to end my dive and come back up to the surface. Wow, you can only imagine, I was hooked. Today, I have no idea if that story was even true, but honestly, who cares? My curiosity was piqued, it got the better of me, and I was determined to find out what this big brown skin was. Spoiler alert, I haven't found out yet, but that's cool because that means I can just spend more time in the water. I suspect this was one of the first moments when I truly realized that the ocean wasn't just this big blue tank of water. But if I lifted the lid and looked in, there was this world, this world that was largely unseen and unexplored. And, and there was so much more that we didn't know about it. And I think I became acutely aware of the fact that we knew very, very little about the waters at my own doorstep. Fast forward a few years, I'm a fresh-faced 18-year-old with massive dreams, and I've graduated from wanting to be this adventurous scientist to a marine biologist, a job with a real job title. Um, and I picked this career because it had all the three key ingredients, uh, adventure, science, and salt water. But, you know, when I started telling people in Sri Lanka that this is what I wanted to do, I wanted to go to university and study to be a marine biologist, many of them would turn to me and say, well, what are you going to do with that degree? And others would turn around to me and say, oh, well, you're going to study abroad, which means you're never going to come home. I mean, I couldn't study to be a marine biologist in Sri Lanka, so I had no choice but to leave. But they were, con you know, they were convinced that I was going to go and never come home because there was no scope in my country, as they thought. I was basically a write-off for them. But I kept telling them with the cocky confidence of an 18-year-old that, I would carve my own niche. Um, I will be honest, uh, now safely way down the line, I can tell you I had no idea what I was going to do, but I wasn't about to give them the pleasure of knowing that. Uh, but the one thing I did know was that I was very committed to coming back and serving my country. So, you know, I come from a culture where when you go to university, you become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or a business person. So you can probably imagine how frivolous it seemed for someone to go off and study for years and, and you know, do the kind of job that I was suggesting. In some ways, I think in hindsight, when I think about it, you know, people were probably concerned that I was going to go study, come back, and there was no, no there would no, no, be no jobs for me. Um, and I think other people, the only job they could associate with the ocean was fishing. And so there, they potentially assumed that I would go study for years, come back and just become a fisherwoman. Anyway, I battled through all of that, all good. And I had the support of my parents, which was great. They told me to do what I loved and I, that I'd do it well. And I will say that I, I don't think they fully knew what a marine biologist was going to do um, because uh, I don't, don't think they knew any marine biologists. But what they did know was that I had a strong sense of what I needed to succeed in my own life. And so they were very supportive around that. So I set off, I went off and did my degree in marine and environmental science at the University of St. Andrews. And then I decided to take a year out uh, because I felt I needed to gain some firsthand experience uh, of what it actually meant to be a marine biologist. Uh, little did I know that this decision, this one year, this you know, time out would set me on a path that I could never ever have anticipated. Let me set the scene a little. It was this beautiful, flat, calm day off the southeast coast of Sri Lanka. You can see the ocean is just 
stunning. Not a ripple on the surface, no wind, sweltering hot. I was working on a whale research vessel that had come from San Diego and we were doing, we were basically tracking sperm whales using, we were eavesdropping on their conversations. We were tracking them with underwater microphones. And then when we found them, we would uh, take these little biopsy samples that could tell us about the toxicology of the ocean environment. <clears throat> but at the same time, we'd have someone up on deck looking out for signs of life. So on this particular day of uh, importance, back in 2003, I was that person standing on deck. I could hear the sperm whales because we would listen to them, collect their sounds through these underwater hydrophones and play them on loudspeaker in the pilot house. So I could hear this cacophony and I knew there was a big pod out there and I was really determined to be the person to spot them that day. But my shift was coming to a close. I was getting frustrated. It was hot, all these things. And I was like, oh gosh, getting a little bit antsy. I mean, I knew what I was looking for, right? because um, I'd been working with sperm whales for a couple of weeks in the Maldives and I was looking out for this low bushy blow slanted off onto the left-hand side. Typical of a sperm whale because sperm whales are toothed whales. They have one blow hole and in, in, this, in this particular species, it happens to be on the left-hand side. So I was, you know, my eyes were peeled. I was staring and staring and my shift was really just coming to a close when I sadly saw this. This is that tall, powerful blow, this tall, powerful vertical blow that went almost, for me, it felt like it was bent up all the way to the sky. I knew immediately that it had been produced by a very large animal. So I got excited. I grabbed the walkie-talkie. I called down to my captain and I said, Bob, Bob, we have to go. 11 o'clock, two kilometers. Let's go now. And he says, why? And I said, well, I, I, I think it's a blue whale. And he says, okay. So he turns the ship in the direction I've sent him off in and we start moving. What I should point out is that I was the deck can on board. I was the person cleaning toilets and polishing brass at the time. Uh, so uh, here I was, uh, I had just steered the vessel off course. Uh, we were on an important scientific mission and here I was like, I was you know, sending them in a direction of an animal that I thought I saw. So I'm panicking obviously. And uh, I'm staring out there, trying not to lose sight of this animal that's blowing intermittently. There's tears streaming down my face. I'm, I'm desperate to like, just see up close. And that's when I thought I was losing my mind. Because I realized it wasn't just one blue whale, but there were six blue whales in an area the size of a soccer pitch. So my mind started reeling. I started to think to myself, wow, well, what's happening here, right? So I was fresh out of undergrad, right? I had the answers. I'd been in class. Uh, my professors and my textbooks told me that large whales like blue whales undertook long range migrations between cold feeding areas and warm breeding and calving areas. Now, Sri Lanka is just five degrees above the equator. So it is as warm and tropical as it can get. So I was now expecting to see these animals breeding and calving. So I'm now urging the captain, I'm saying, let's go faster, faster, let's get there. I didn't want this to end. You know, I didn't want to miss out this golden opportunity. And as we got closer and closer and closer, I realized it wasn't at all what I was expecting to see. These whales were certainly not meeting. I think I'd know if they were. And there were no cows in the so there were no babies. Um, instead, these animals were just kind of lolling around. They were, you know, diving, coming up sitting on the surface, very casual. And then I got a little confused. I thought, oh, come on. So I said to my captain, I said, Bob, you think we can maybe stick around for a little longer and just see what's going on? And he says, yeah. And that's when I saw this. This is my Eureka moment. If you're wondering what it is, it's a pile of blue whale poop. My Eureka moment, a crucial turning point in my career came in the form of an aggregation of blue whales and a floating pile of whale poop. Now, why it's so exciting is that, like I said, you know, I was expecting these whales to go to cold waters to feed. But the fact that they were feeding and pooping in these waters meant they were feeding. And, you know, these are warm tropical waters. Super, super unexpected. So it, it totally went against everyone's expectations. It was so exciting that I immediately, literally immediately started writing to experts in the field, asking for guidance and support to launch my research. 
The responses came fast and furious, but in a nutshell, they said, it sounds like an exciting discovery. Please apply for a research permit so I can bring my teams out and do the research. Wow. This wasn't quite what I was expecting, to be honest. I was asking for support and help, and here they wanted to do the work themselves. Okay, despite the fact that I had no money and no idea how I was going to start this project, I knew I wasn't going to give in. So I politely refused the generous offer to swoop in and take over my research or my dream or I take over my discovery. I worked for five more years to earn a little bit of money so I could establish the Sri Lankan Blue World Project. To date, it is the longest running Blue World Project within the Northern Indian Ocean. My work has gone on to change what we knew about tropical blue world populations. But I will say that first encounter with parachute science, because that's what it's called, is obviously something that I carry with me all the time. Okay, so just to, so that everyone's on the same page, parachute science and colonial science is the conservation model where researchers from the developing world or the global north come to countries like mine um, and do research and leave without any investment in human capacity or infrastructure. It creates a dependency on external expertise, makes it very unsustainable in the long term, as you can imagine. It cripples local conservation efforts. It undermines the work that's going on on the ground, often long term work. And the work is driven by outsiders' assumptions, motives, and personal needs. This often leads to an unfavorable power imbalance between those from the outside and those on the ground. What I realized in that moment when you know, I got those emails saying, get us a research permit, we will bring our teams out to do the work. I realized very quickly that I was being judged by my, my capabilities were being judged not by, uh, by basically by where I came from rather than what I could actually do, the change I could actually drive. And it was very disappointing to me. But over time, rather than let it dishearten me and turn me away from the work that I truly loved and I dreamt of from the time I was a child, it has, you know, I've realized that I can use it to, to empower others. I can tell my stories and start to try to change the model that exists uh, so that it doesn't become a hindrance for others like me. In the end, I want to blaze trails. We all do. But I want to blaze trails that are so wide that others can actually surpass me. Because, and I want to break down these barriers that get in the way of us doing good work for the sake of the planet. Over the years, I've experienced parachute science in so many ways. From scientists who want to piggyback on my research permits just so they can use my face uh, because they need it to do work in my country to funders who have demanded that I take bigger risks uh, in exchange for the money they were giving me uh, without a true understanding about what those risks would do to my career. Uh, they didn't understand the ground realities, the political situation, and it could have done a lot of damage. Um, to collaborators who've underpaid me just because of where I came from or basically budgeted for much less than I was worth. Um, so the list goes on, but you know, like I said, I've made it my mission to speak up and try to right the wrongs. I've taken steps like, you know, rejecting funding or walking out of big projects because they expected me to be complicit in kind of this parachute model that I don't support. You know, being outspoken doesn't always work in your favor, but what I can say in this situation is it, it has found me a lot of allies and that's really important. Good people on both sides, people who have been at the receiving end of those parachuters, but also those who have parachuted and realized that the model needs to be changed, both for the sake of our oceans, but also for the sake of making marine conservation more equitable. I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about it, our oceans are 70% of our planet. A handful of people from one part of the world can't resolve all the problems of our oceans. And the more people out there working for our oceans, the better. So if we can create these opportunities, it can be more inclusive and equitable, we will achieve much more for our oceans. 
I'm also very heartened by the fact that these are growing conversations. In a, uh, this topic is a growing conversation in other fields like medicine, genomics, um, anthropology, and so many others. I'm learning of societies that are uh, putting into place guidelines for their members who are going abroad to volunteer. There are journals that are asking scientists to um, you know, basically declare if they, their work involves parachute science or not when they're submitting for a publication. And some grants even fund shortlisted applicants to actually go to those different countries they want to work in to work with their partners on the ground, to come up with a, a collaborative uh, partnership, something that has that's uh, an equal partnership um, for their pri uh, final proposals. Um, and, you know, scientists and researchers from the global south are becoming more vocal about what it has done to their work, how it has affected them. And, uh, you know, others are speaking about questioning the very basis of how we name species. A lot of species have very Western centric uh, names, uh, even though they're discovered in other parts of the world. And, uh, you know, people are also questioning why we overlook places that have been part of indigenous cultures for generations until they're discovered, so to speak, by an outsider. All in all, you know, there is a, uh, there's a, you know, a groundswell happening and there's a collective recognition of the long lasting negative impacts of parachuting and why we must change this if we want to make progress. So if we come back to our oceans, if you think about it, 70% of our coastlines are in the developing world. Um, so, of, you know, if you think about the ocean, it's 70% of our planet, but 70% of the coastlines are in the developing world, the global south. But represent, representation at the global stage is disproportional. The harsh truth is, if we aren't being inclusive and equitable, we aren't going to move the needle on the things that matter, the things that are integral to our very existence, and we will continue to fail. Building the mechanisms that will en enable us to continue the important work of conservation no matter what should be a priority. The pandemic has been a great teacher, especially to those who work across the world, who forgot to build these equal partnerships, who forgot to make sure that everyone had the equal ability. Um, and so the lack of travel has meant that they have these incredibly valuable data sets that now have gaping holes in them. These are things that could have been easily avoided. In my work in Sri Lanka, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build a better model for how these partnerships come about. Uh, we have solid partnerships with some of the best scientists in the world who share our values and believe in this model where everyone has something to offer. They are mutually beneficial partnerships. We recognize that we can learn from each other. It's a two-way learning system. Uh, you know, I, I can I, I come up with the questions because I know what the priorities are in my country. And I know what the ground situation is, but I also recognize that there's expertise externally that can really enhance the work that we're doing. And so for us, this is what counts, because at the end, we want to make sure we're preparing students to conduct world class re research and supporting them through the process. And also by so doing it this way, we're increasing the number of people who can look after our various coastlines all across our world and therefore our oceans. So Yes, you know, parachute science isn't the way forward. And, I, and I'm so excited to think that we're trying to change that model across many disciplines. But I also want to talk a little bit about what it mat why it matters to be that person who's local uh, based on my experiences. And one thing I've found is being local, having experts on the ground makes things happen a lot faster, makes, means that there are resources available at critical times. So that's really, what it's been for me, what it's been like for me. At the start of the pandemic last year, we in Sri Lanka went into a lockdown for two months. Lockdowns in Sri Lanka are very strict. We can't leave our houses. I'm in one right now, as we speak. And, um, you know, everybody was really worried for the daily wage worker, right? These are people who only earn money on the days that they do work. I was particularly concerned about the small scale fishers because they are daily wage workers and they make up the vast majority of our fishing community in this country. So while we were still in lockdown, I kind of hatched this idea, I hatched a plan. I reached out to a good friend, but also an amazing collaborator from Fiji, Dr. Sangeeta Mangubai, who has extensive research in social science, uh, extensive um, experience and expertise in social science research, 
particularly pertaining, pertaining to small scale fisheries. Uh, we worked on it together. We developed the plan together. I then, um, you know, uh, uh, was able to apply for a grant. And in this particular situation, it was a Marine Conservation Action Fund grant from the New England Aquarium. As Elizabeth mentioned, it's a great grant. And I'm not, I wasn't, you know, nobody's asking me to say this, but I will say it's unique in that it's avail it's an emergency grant that is very focused on supporting local leaders in their own countries. And that's not a common case. And so that I, I you know, turned to them, I applied for this grant, received the funding while we're still in lockdown because we knew we had the money. I was able to um, hire my team. And, and the other cool thing about being local was that my work is, is well recognized in the country. It has inspired more young people to get into marine conservation, which means there's this group of very enthusiastic young uh, people who want to partake in this kind of research. And so I was able to go ahead with my team, hire uh, 14 marine enthusiasts and be ready. Basically, we train them over Zoom which is you know, our way of life now, uh, prepared them uh, to do social science research and, and you know, build up their skills in the process. And uh, we were ready for when the lockdown, ban uh, lockdown would lift and when it was safe enough for us to dispatch our teams. So of course, when the moment came, we were quick off the draw. Um, you know, much like today, we were so unsure then, you know, once the lockdown lifted, what would happen? How long would we have? So we had to move very, very fast. Our team conducted 415 surveys in one month across the entire coastline. Um, it's not a small space. It looks like a smallish island, but it's actually not that small. Uh, this was a massive feat, but it was only possible because we were local and we found people who were local to those communities. They were working, the, the research assistants we picked were people who already had pre-existing ties in these communities. That's so important because uh, fishers and anybody really uh, are more honest if they talk to people they trust and they talk, trust people that they know. Some of our young researchers were fishers themselves. Some were students who had already worked in those communities, done some work. Um, others had relatives in those communities. So we were able to move fast, collect the data, um, and, and, and that was because we were local. And as you can tell, because we were hyper-local in some situations. And this report that was just released uh, about a, a month or so ago um, is now being used for fisheries policy in the country. So that's that's very significant. Um, another situation where being local was very important was when a juvenile southern elephant seal turned up at our doorstep. If anyone, I can't see your faces, but I'm hope you're, hoping you all, all look very surprised. It turned up on our coastline at the end of 2019, clearly very lost. Most people in my country had no idea what a seal was, uh, let alone, you know, uh, they'd not heard of a seal, much less seen one. We don't have a word for it in our local languages. Um, so for me, as a person who is a marine mammalogist, who has uh, some decent knowledge on, this, uh, on these populations, who has a great network of experts that I can tap into, this was a great opportunity for me to support the local authorities in understanding the species better so we could manage the situation well. But also, I mean, I can tell you, people um, received this animal like it was an alien that had turned up at our doorstep. It was quite, quite cool to watch, actually. But also, it allowed me to engage the public and provide them with some knowledge about this unique visitor that we had. Based on you know, uh, what I knew, you know, I could tell people, look, this animal is here for one month. It's going to molt, and then it's going to leave. And this was really important because people were panicking when they started to see this animal daily losing more and more chunks of fur off its back, right? They thought it was a disease, but at least once I told them it was molting, that was great. People could relax a little bit. And this was also really neat because the more I shared through our social media and everything else, the more they started scouring the shoreline for this, this um, elephant seal. And so they would report back to me. I could track where it was moving based on people's sightings. They became my citizen scientists. They became my eyes on the ground. And uh, while, you know, for me, what was really precious about this was while most people, like I said, don't swim, they don't go into the water, they can't marvel at that life beneath the waves. This moment in time, this animal, this wildlife from the ocean came out to see us. And I thought that was quite powerful especially just watching the faces of everybody who stopped to observe it. 
Um, last year, during uh, another lockdown, we had a pot of 100 pilot whales wash up on a beach just uh, close to where I live. Now, again, I couldn't leave my home, but because of the fact that um, my work is known, I was able to speak to the government and offer my expertise, get a special curfew pass, head down to the site and help people understand how best to deal with the animals. Uh, the simplest thing, I mean, something that many of us might take for granted, the fact that, you know, the blowholes on the top of the head, that's its nostril, that's where it breeds from, uh, was something that lots of people didn't know. So in, during the rescue, being able to just tell them that we had to make sure that the blowhole wasn't obstructed in any way became really vital. The local community are the true heroes here. They came out in their numbers despite the curfew and the lockdown, and they really worked hard for 24 hours and together we're able to save 96 of these 100 pilot whales. Right now, at this very moment, Sri Lanka is facing one of the biggest marine environmental disasters we have ever had in our history. The MV Express Pearl caught fire off our coast about 10 days ago, it's a ship. And subsequently it has released, and, and, and the fire has just about been doused but you know, there is damage, right? It has released you know, a yet unknown quantity, but possibly billions of these tiny plastic pellets or nurdles that you can see in this picture. They're microplastics. These are primary microplastics, and these are what we use to make other plastic things, right? They're buoyant by their very nature. So they're floating around, they're getting caught in our currents. They're washing up on our beautiful beaches, uh, on our west coast and our south coast. For now, within 10 days, it's reached our south coast. Uh, we anticipate that it will go around the island, possibly get to our east coast as well. This is very detrimental to us. Our tourism industry typically is based on, you know, people coming to see our beaches. Um, there are species that nest on our beaches, like turtles, that can be affected by this. Species will ingest them. Fishermen are losing their livelihoods because they can't go out to fish these days. So the one thing I can say is that it's a grim situation. It's not ideal, but I can be helpful because I'm local, because I'm here. I can provide advice and guide because of the sort of knowledge and expertise that I have but also because I'm local, but have worked globally over years doing degrees across the world and working with collaborators across the world, um, they, I can tap into these networks to ensure we're getting the best possible information and doing things right on the ground. And I can support all the amazing people on the ground here, the authorities, the university, um, uh, people from universities, researchers who are coming together right now to try to address this big problem. I mean, the list is endless, but I've always wanted my life to be useful to more than just myself. And I can tell you that the career I've picked and the way I've chosen to do this has allowed me to sort of achieve this mission at some level. While I started out, as you can tell, quite focused on blue whales and their conservation, my skill set has broadened because you know, over time, my understanding of the local situation, because I've been here and working here for so long, uh, I, I've got more of an understanding of the need and, uh, and, and I can come up with uh, ways to try to understand and, and work out these, work through these problems better. There are so many marine conservation related questions to be asked. There aren't very, very many of us here. But the great thing is that being local has also inspired a new generation of ocean heroes. Uh, people follow the work, they want to be a part of it and that's just magical. We need more people involved. And I realized that because I, I, I can ask the questions but I don't have to be the person answering them as well, right? So that means I can create opportunities for others. I, I mean, I strongly believe talent is equally distributed while opportunity isn't. And I definitely think the solution to our greatest ocean challenges are trapped possibly in the minds of students in the developing world. There's so many of them and we just have to believe. So my job is very simple. It's to find the per that person, that person who has these great ideas and to create opportunities and open doors. Because at the end of the day, I believe 
that if we truly want to save our oceans, every coastline needs a local hero. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asha, for that incredibly informative, enlightening, inspiring, and just all around wonderful presentation. Um, we do have, not surprisingly, we do have quite a number of questions for you from our audience. Some that have come in um, uh, during registration from the globe. Um, so from Marissa, can we tag and follow whale species that are close to extinction, perhaps preventing boat strikes? Okay, that's a great question. We can tag whales um, and to track where they're moving, we can use satellite tags to, uh, tags to do that. Um, it's, so it just depends. So one thing is that satellite tagging can be invasive. Uh, there's a barb that's inserted into the animal so it, just, so it can stay on in the long term. Uh, some researchers choose not to use that method. We can track, track them very differently. We can use natural tags. So we can look at the markings on their bodies and uh, they're very unique. They're like your, thumb, you know, your fingerprint, your thumbprint. Each one has a different marking, long-term nicks and cuts. We can use those to identify the individuals. And that's a much better way, especially if the populations are smaller, we wanna minimize that sort of like interaction, uh, invasive interaction with them. Um, and uh, it can, you know, you know, ship strikes are a very complicated problem. It's something that I've devoted like nine years of my life to. Um, complicated in the sense that we have to find a balance between understanding that that 99% of every 90% of everything is shipped, and there's an industry out there that's running because of all of us. Uh, but also, how do we prioritize protection for these species? How do we share our spaces? So it. We sometimes we don't need to tag these animals to know how to separate the space of where the ships are and where the whales are. We just have to understand that there are particular areas where they aggregate. There might be better feeding in those areas, for example. And if that's the case, we just need to figure out how do we shift those shipping lanes out of those areas, out of their kitchens, basically, so we can minimize that crossover, that overlap uh, to protect them better. Okay, thank you. Um, this is from Heather. Do the blue whales from Sri Lanka also swim through the waters of the Maldives, where I've been unfortunate, where I've been fortunate to scuba dive many times? Yeah, so it's the same population. Um, like I said, the blue whales in Sri Lanka are, and I, uh, they're the only non-migratory blue whales in the world. And by that we mean that they don't go to the cold waters to feed, right? So they're staying in these warm tropical waters throughout their lives. Uh, their, their range is quite limited. They'll go along the east coast of Sri Lanka, but they will go to the Maldives up into sort of Oman and back around Sri Lanka, but they're largely around Sri Lanka. But yeah, absolutely. And the Maldives is beautiful. Okay, so this is sort of a follow on, but does the population you study range all the oceans um, and interact, uh, mix and breed with those in the Atlantic Ocean? No, so this is what's cool, right? There's multiple populations of blue whales in the world. And what's neat about that is, well, one thing is, so that's when, when people say to me, how many blue whales are there out there, right? It's a complicated answer, right? I can say, I, I, I don't know the number off my top of my head, but hypothetically say there's 10,000, right? I can say there are 10,000, or I can say there's five populations and they all add up to 10,000. Why does that matter? Because the whales in different ocean basins are adapted to live in that particular ocean basin, right? So as you can tell, the blue whales around Sri Lanka, they're non-migratory. They like warm tropical water. I mean, who doesn't, right? I'll be honest. I'm they're as local as I am, basically. But the point being that they have adapted that how they feed, the species that they feed on is different to the species that they feed on in the Atlantic, for example. They have a different vocal dialect to the blue whales out in the other parts of the oceans, right? In, in off California. If by some miracle I could pick up, because I am so strong, a blue whale from Sri Lanka and take it and drop it into the ocean in, in California, off California, the whales wouldn't be able to speak to each other because they have different dialects. So the point being that it's not that we have 10,000 blue whales in the world. We have multiple populations and each population has their own culture. And if you had attended the lecture before mine, which was Brian Skerry, somehow he always speaks before me at events, <laughs> which is odd, but 
you'd understand that idea of culture and how precious it is and how important it is that we recognize that these different populations have different cultures. We have to understand them, but protect them individually without blanket protection. Because if we lose a population in Sri Lanka, we're losing an entire culture. Okay. Um, we, we've had some questions come in on the, the ship disaster. Um, okay. So um, it's, is it all right to eat con and consume fish in our country of, of Sri Lanka due to the Pearl Express ship incident? Okay, so, you know, I'm going to say it's a, this is a very tricky question. Things are unfolding right now. The big, you know, we have a massive scientific team. There's loads of people trying to understand how do we better understand the situation on the ground? It's just all unraveling right now. Um, the one, I can say a couple of things. One is, I know the government has uh, banned fishing along that coastline around where the ship is, the immediate vicinity. But what I, I would personally say is, you know, ship, some fish are local. They will stay in very small areas. Some fish will move longer distances. So I think the government has, uh, uh, the si government scientists have, um, a, uh, that what they want to do is to start testing fish, not just in that band area, but outside it also to understand what, what the situation is a little bit better. So this is a pretty vague answer, uh, but the point being that we still don't know and we're still trying to figure out. Okay. So, Back to behavior of blue whales, how sophisticated is whale communication? Could it be as complex and precise as human speech? Speech, and what do we know? That's a really great question. You know, like it's, uh, okay, so it's a, it's obviously tricky, right? How will we even really know um, how complex, I mean, it, it, it is complex. If you think about a humpback whale song, right? If you listen to it, there's like phrases and units and it's just complex musical symphony, right? That they create. Um, and I, I would say, yes, it's complex, but we don't fully understand how complex. Uh, we'll never be able to understand if they can speak in words because we can't necessarily observe a, an action while they're making the sound, right? Because that's important for us to associate whether that sound is, relates to a particular word. But what I can tell you is there is a project, a very new project uh, called Project SETI, C-E-T-I. Um, and there's a great team of scientists and they're coming together to try to unravel a bit more uh, about sperm whale communication. So yes, the short answer is it is complicated. How complicated, we don't know. There's a team trying to figure it out. Will we ever know what sperm whales are saying or any whales are saying? I don't know, but personally, I kind of think it's cool that we don't fully understand everything because I think they need to have their privacy too. Okay, um, how do you think, this is from Dennis, how do you think the establishment of offshore wind farms along the Eastern seaboard will affect our fisheries and ocean mammals? Is it wait and see or do we have facts now to answer that question? That's a great question. And I will say that I'm, I don't have the answers because I'm not very uh, familiar with offshore wind farms. Uh, because we don't really have them here in Sri Lanka and I've never really studied them. So I'm going to have to skip on that. I'm sorry. All right. We are doing a lot of work uh, on that uh, issue at the Anderson Cabot Center. And um, I can't speak for our, our very talented scientists, but the, there, that would be a good place to seek some information. Um, okay. So how can we help the cause? This is from Mark. How can we help the cause to save the blue whales in Sri Lanka and wherever they roam? That's a great question. Um, uh, I would say there's so many things. Uh, obviously, you know, conservation projects are always looking for funding, so that's one big way. But other than that, there's in-kind contributions as well. Like there might you might have a skill set that would be really valuable in terms of um, you know, uh, you know, communicating the work we do. Uh, you know, we do lots of videos, productions of those things. There's skills you might have that you can contribute. Um, apart from that, share the stories. I think it's so powerful. We forget how important it is to share stories. And, you know, the problem is that, like, the thing is that we, we the ocean is all around us, right? But it is, life ends at the shoreline, not just in Sri Lanka. It actually ends at the shoreline in many places across the world. A lot of people are not familiar with what's happening in the ocean right at their doorstep and certainly not across the world. The more we talk about the oceans, the more we make them part of our everyday conversation, the more we consider these stories and excite people about the oceans, that's when we're gonna also start to see some movement. That's when we're gonna start to see 
more people coming on board. And um, so I would say share stories. That's that's really important too. Okay. Um, how has Blue Whale tourism been affected by COVID travel restrictions? Has less human activity had any noticeable impacts on Blue Whale behavior? From Brian. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. I can tell you here in Sri Lanka that there's not been any boats. We haven't been able to go out to sea since uh, last year. So we were on the water. Uh, my team was on the water right before our first lockdown, before we totally understood what was going on. I literally got off the water on the Friday and on Monday, the whole country went into lockdown for two months. Um, but this year we weren't able to go back. Uh, but there is other shipping activity that happens like in the massive shipping i mean the south coast of sri lanka is one of the biggest shipping highways in the world so it i would say that that's probably still having an impact um but yeah like i don't know in terms of whale watching industry industry interactions but also one thing you have to remember is that there was a pause period the anthropause as it's called uh where ships uh, like the noise in the oceans would have reduced and that would have been a really nice break for these animals and i would encourage you to check out hakai magazine has a new podcast it's a five-part series five-part series on ocean noise and it addresses this but also some of the amazing work that's happened in the at the new england aquarium um, on like stress levels and sound and how when you have less sound in the oceans, how the animals are less stressed. But um, yeah, here out here, we don't know because we haven't been allowed to go out to the ocean. Okay, um, here's, a, here's a big question. How many blue whales are in existence today? Big question. Like I said, you know, like if you look at the IUCN red list, they say it's about 10,000. Um, of, of that, there's supposed to be, I think a population of about maybe about 3,000 of California. Remember, they'll have their own unique culture. Um, around Sri Lanka, we don't yet know. So we're trying to uh, come up with our first estimate. It isn't easy. These are large, very elusive animals, but we use a pretty simple technique, which means it takes a long time. So we use photo identification, where we take photographs of these very characteristic markings on their bodies that can help us to tell whether same individual or a different individual that's come in. Um, a lot of places in the world, they're still coming up with numbers. So we don't know. There's an overall number that says 10,000. But again, remember, there's multiple populations, which will have multiple cultures, which have to be protected individually. All right. And you now you talked about uh, the, the uh, issue of ship strikes. And so what is the biggest threat to these, these whales today? Yeah, globally, the biggest threat to whales is ship strike. Um, so you think about it, 90% of everything is shipped. Um, and there's distinct overlap where the whales are and where the ships are. So it is a big problem. And, you know, it, it, like these ships, uh, they don't even realize, more, most often they don't even realize when they hit, hit a whale because a whale is gigantic to us. But to a gigantic, gigantic ship, it's not that big, right? So this ha probably happens more than we even know or can document. Um, so ship strike is the biggest problem, but also entanglement is a significant issue. If you think about the population of North Atlantic right whales at, at your doorstep, if you live um, on the east coast of the US, um, you know, they get entangled in the lobster pots in the in the line and, and that's been pretty detrimental to them too. So entanglement is another problem um, for, for whales. Hey. Um, lastly, could you, if you could give a piece of advice to a young student aspiring to marine biologist, but still anxious to skip the tra traditional career path? I would say, you know what, lead with your passion, but also remember there's multiple things to this, right? If you're going off the traditional career path, there's going to be a lot of people who will tell you that you can't do it and you're not going to achieve anything and you don't know, you know, how you're going to make it. And they're going to question how you're going to make money. There's going to be a lot of questions. Be prepared for that. Understand it's coming from a place of concern. Like I said, when I reflect back on my life, there was definitely concern in that question about what are you going to do with that degree, right? But that meant I had to work a lot harder. I have I mean, my parents have been very supportive, but I've had to work a lot harder to convince them every step of the way that it is the right decision that I've made. But I've led with passion. I've, I've worked super hard. And I have really dedicated myself to it. So I think that made a difference. That meant I could block out everything else that was happening. Also know it's going to have more challenges than the average career, right? You're going to hit roadblocks every turn you take. But that doesn't mean you can't climb over the roadblock or walk around it, right? So I don't want you to be dissuaded by it. Recognize that there are challenges, 
that you can get around them somehow. It might take you longer to get to where you want to go, but that's okay. That's all part of the journey. And as I always tell people, if I didn't have those challenges, if I didn't have those roadblocks, imagine how boring my story would be. The New England Aquarium would not want me to have do a talk, right? If I was just like, I woke up, I became a marine biologist, I got a job, there you go. They'd be like, it's cool, we don't want to know. But because I have these challenges I can share, it makes it far more interesting. And the reality is there's way more people out there who've been through these challenges, who feel seen and heard. And the more we can share these, the more we realize that, you know what, it's not unique to me. It's not special. I'm not the only person having trouble trying to get through this. There are other people out there and we build these supportive communities. So yeah, like to me, like, you know, I'm not the person to tell you that you shouldn't take a non-traditional career path, obviously. So I would say, go do it, commit yourself to it, be prepared to work extra hard and to keep pushing, but know you can do it in the end. Wonderful. Well, that's a really inspiring note to um, to end, uh, end today on. And I, I have a few closing remarks and just wanted to start off by saying thank you, Asha, for sharing this past hour with us and for helping to educate us on the important work you're doing in Sri Lanka. We're so grateful to you for helping to raise awareness on the importance of healthy oceans and local heroes and for showcasing how each one of us can become an ocean hero. If you'd like to learn more about Asha and Oceanswell, I would encourage you all to visit oceanswell.org on the web and on social media. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the wonderful supporters who helped make the MCAF program possible, including the Akiko Shiraki Diner Fund, the Curtis Neath Munson Foundation, the New England Biolabs Foundation, the New England Biolabs Corporation, and many generous individuals. I also want to express our deep gratitude to our MCAF grantees and fellows who, like Asha, are working tirelessly every day to save the ocean. If you enjoyed this program and want to help support our ocean education and conservation work, please consider giving to the Aquarium's Marine Conservation Action Fund at neaq.org. Today's event was made possible with generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allowed the Aquarium to offer it free of charge. We are grateful to have their support each season. And thanks to our presentation partner, the Boston Globe. We also hope you will join us on June 21st for our final lecture of our spring series featuring Dr. Cornell Brooks, a distinguished pre professor from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and a former president of the NAACP. Thank you all and have a terrific day.